So while those are being passed out, I'd like to start by asking a few riddles. So I need you to listen very close because I'm only going to ask each question one time. You guys ready? No. Okay. Very ready. We're all ready. Okay. So listen up. Is there a federal law against a man marrying his widow's sister? No, there'd be no need for a law because the man's dead. His widow's sister? How many animals of each species did Moses bring aboard the ark with him during the great flood? Yeah, there you go. So how about this? According to international law, if an airplane crashed on the exact border between two countries, would the unidentified survivors be buried in the country they were traveling to or traveling from? Yeah, I'm hoping we're not burying the survivors. Just going to say. Okay. So here we go. A man builds an ordinary house with four sides, except each side has a southern exposure. A bear comes to the door and rings the doorbell. What color is the bear? Why is it a white bear? The polar bear. Yeah. Okay, last one. Last one. You guys ready? You are the bus driver. You drive three blocks and pick up two people. You drive three more blocks and one person gets off. You drive around the corner and you pick up five people. How old is the bus driver? Eleven. How old you are? Exactly. However you old. You're the bus driver. Please be safe. Thirty-eight. All right. So how did each of you do? You get some of them, maybe some were easy, maybe some were challenging. So this evening as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to talk a lot about listening, some of the obstacles that we have to hearing, what we do with God's word when it's difficult to hear, and the action that God calls us to when we listen. So let's start by opening in a word of prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to come together to just dive into your word. And Lord, I pray tonight that as we seek to hear what you have to say, Lord, that you would be glorified through the words that are given. And Lord, you will just give us hearts that are ready to hear. Father, I pray these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So listening is often a hard thing to do. What are some of the reasons that we struggle so often with listening? A few that came to my mind, maybe the distractions going on around us. Maybe that friend sitting next to you is doodling something that's more interesting than listening, right? So what about, my fingers are not working, sorry. Different events in our lives. It could have been a hard day at school. You might have a big test or paper due tomorrow. Somebody close to you may be dealing with an illness or injury or maybe even you. The subject just might not be interesting, right? I mean, as interesting as the 500 pictures I have of my last vacation is to me, it probably isn't to you, right? So maybe you're just sitting there thinking, you know, I've heard this before. Why are we talking about this again? Maybe you're just not ready to listen. So I'm sure giving time, you could come up with many more internal and external influences on our ability to hear. But as you think through these lists, I'd like you to recognize that this list could be applied to just about anything, your school, your chores, the games we play. How much more can these things and some of the obstacles that we'll see in our text tonight 
affect our ability to hear what God has to say to us. So let's start by reading verse 1 through 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. So if you're not there, if you get there really quick, and we'll jump in. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark was. When the Lord called Samuel, he said, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. Then the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli. And he said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. I apologize, I must have had an extra one in there. And he arose and he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Sir Samuel went to lay down in his place. So I find it interesting, after the text brings us up to date on where Samuel is there at Shiloh, serving in the presence, serving the Lord in the presence of Eli, that it immediately tells us in the second half of the first verse And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Historically, we're closing the time of the judges. And throughout this time, Israel has been going through a cycle of obedience and blessing only to turn away to other gods. When God then withdrew his blessing and allowed a foreign nation to conquer Israel, they would cry out to God who would then, in his mercy, bring a judge to bring them back to faith. Here we've heard over the past few weeks that Eli's leadership as high priest has not been good. He's allowed his sons to take the finest offerings that the people brought to the Lord, and instead of stoning them for their blasphemy, he gives them at best a weak rebuke. He's described as having eyes that had begun to grow dim so he could not see. Now, this could be a comment purely reflecting Eli's eyesight and his, it's deteriorating with age. However, I tend to agree with some commentaries that I read that this was more than just a physical issue. It's also reflective of Eli's spiritual eyes and ears. Of anyone, you would think that Eli would have recognized it was God calling Samuel. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years. And he'd been a father to Samuel growing up at Shiloh. Yet it took God calling Samuel three times for Eli to recognize that it was the Lord calling him. And then at that point, he could counsel Samuel how to respond. Eli's relationship with God was broken to the point that God intended to cut him and his family off due to their sin. I see a lesson for us in that sin in our lives can be an obstacle to us to be able to see what God is doing not only in our lives, but in the lives of others around us. Now put yourself in Samuel's place. He hears his name called out in the middle of the night. We saw earlier that he's been ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. 
by Samuel's first three responses to God's call, we see that he has responsibilities to care for Eli. He gets up and he goes to Eli's side to find out what he needs. So at your age, I'm going to guess that most of you aren't, haven't necessarily had somebody calling out your name in the middle of the night because they need you. Maybe some of you have. Maybe you care for a sibling or a parent, grandparent that you have responsibilities for. Maybe not. But I can tell you as a parent, when I, hear, when I heard my son's calling my name in the middle of the night, there was a shot of adrenaline. I went to go see what was going on. And I went to pursue to take care of him. So in this, Samuel's circumstances interfered with him being able to see that this was God calling him. He'd go to Eli. He didn't recognize that the Lord was calling him. So now again, let's think back to Samuel's circumstances, how we had been raised, where he lived. Wouldn't you think that day, serving day in, day out in the tabernacle, that he would be pretty in tune with what God wants him to do? I'm sure he count, sat through countless teaching on his duties. I'm sure he heard sermons and teachings about what God had done for the Israelites. And over time, you would think that he would be pretty in tune with what God wanted. For God, going to youth group, Sunday morning Bible study, going to church. All these things are good things, but in and of themselves, they don't make us a Christian. They don't make us a follower of Christ. So we need to have that personal relationship with God and through that, the Holy Spirit to help us understand what God wants, would to hear God and be able to understand and bring that in. So Proverbs 3, 1 through 8 illustrates this point. Sorry for the eye test. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep. Verse 5 points out that we, just as Samuel did, need God to help us understand. Being ready to listen means relying on God to provide spiritual ears to hear. So we've talked a bit about some of the obstacles to hearing that we've seen in these first few verses. But... What are some of the means that we hear God? Now, I'm going to come right out and say that we're probably in this day and time not going to hear the audible voice of God calling to us or to feel the presence that Samuel did when the Lord came. And in verse 10, it says, The Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Our experience and understanding of God comes first and foremost from his word. It's the foundation upon which our faith is built. He speaks to us through the time spent studying his word, 
we grow and mature in our understanding of who God is and how we can reflect him to others. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3 says, Blessed is... Please hear these words. God's word is not something to handle trivially. It's a treasure to go seek. It's not something we do just to check off a box and say, yep, I read my Bible today. It's something that through it, we understand and know God. So another way that we hear the voice of God is through others. Through fellowship with other believers, we're called to build one another up in the faith. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 implores us to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. And let us stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's my hope that as we gather each week at youth group, Sunday morning Bible study, or church, that you're mutually encouraging one another towards a deeper relationship with Christ. Now I'll ask this, have you ever worked on a group project? You might sit with that group through a set of instructions from the teacher. Yet when you get into your group, has everybody heard the same thing in those instructions? Probably not. The person next to you may have a completely different understanding of what was heard. The same thing applies to when we're listening to God's word. That's why we have community. That's why we have small groups and discussion because each person hears something different out of a message. God uses the church to build one another up to love and good works. So another way that we grow together is by serving others. 1 Peter 1, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 says, As each has a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as the one who speaks oracles from God, whoever serves as one who serves by strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Each of us has been given individual gifts to use to God's glory. 
In exercising these gifts, God stretches us. He puts us in uncomfortable positions. For me personally, even spending the time preparing this message tonight forced me to go deeper into the word, to study more, to see what God has for us here in this message tonight. And another means that I thought of as we thought about ways that we hear God is hearing God through worship and prayer. God is worthy of more praise and worship than I could ever offer. He intercedes on our behalf, even when we don't have words to pray. Bringing praise to God and leaning upon him in prayer helps us to understand and hear his word. So as we move forward, once again, let's go back to our text and look at 1 Samuel 3, 10 through 18. And the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel says, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill again against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. He said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So when Samuel was ready to listen to the word of the Lord, he got some hard news. He heard that the man who raised him, who he served, Eli and his family were going to be cut off from the Lord. We've talked about some of those obstacles that we have to God speaking to us and some of the ways that he speaks to us. But what do we do when what we hear when we're listening is hard to deal with? Maybe we're convicted of sin in our lives, something that we need to change, something we need to turn away from. Matthew 18, 7 through 9 paints a pretty strong picture of a response to sin in our lives. It says, woe to, the temptation, woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. Now, I'm not saying that we take this literally and start chopping off hands, gouging out, gouging out eyes. Just saying. I see this as speaking figuratively to the extremes that God may call us to drive sin from our lives so that we might reflect his glory. But God has other challenges in his word that can be just as hard as this. Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In Luke 18, 22. He challenged the rich young ruler to sell all of his possessions, give it to the poor, and follow him. 
Could the rich young ruler do that? No. James 1, 2 says that we should count it all joy when we encounter various trials. Is that an easy thing for us to do? Counting it joy when we encounter trials. Hearing what God says, says is not always going to be easy. And in our text, we see Samuel struggling with what he heard. He knew that Eli would want that account of what God had said. But what does Samuel do? He sets aside his own needs, wants, desires, maybe even his place at Shiloh, and tells Eli everything that the Lord told him. He honors God and seeks after God first. That's how we need to respond when God challenges us. We see in Matthew 13, 1 through 9, the parable of the sower, and I'm just going to go through and we're going to talk about the soils for a quick moment. There are four types of soils that are described. The path where the birds came and ate all the seed. The rocky soil that grew but had no depth. Nothing to endure what came. The soil among the thorns and weeds that choked out what would be good. But then there's that fourth soil. The soil that, when it was sown, produced a hundredfold. We see what type of soil Samuel was as we move to the end of the chapter. So, verse 19 through 21, and Samuel. of his words fall to the ground. Think about that statement for a quick moment. What, what do you think that means that the Lord let none of his words fall to the ground? That means that when Samuel was speaking the words of God, they came true. And Samuel faithfully spoke those words of God. So none of those words were cast aside. They were from God. So in the faithfulness of Samuel, Israel would once again hear the word of the Lord. As my last point, I think that we see that hearing the word of God spurs us to action. Just as Samuel pursued after God, When we hear God's word, it does not return void and without effect. In Matthew 4, 18 through 20, Jesus calls Simon Peter and Andrew to follow him and become fishers of men. And they did just that. They listened, heard the word of God speaking to them, and followed. How will you respond when you hear God calling to you? Listening is an active task. It requires our attention to understand all of what is being said. There will be obstacles to us seeking to listen to the voice of God. Unrepentant sin in our lives. Our circumstances. Maybe if we don't know the Lord, not having that Holy Spirit to help us develop that understanding 
We hear the word of God in his word by the preaching of it, through our own study, discussion with others, through worship and prayer and in service. Even when we hear what's difficult in God's words, we know that God has purpose in it. He calls us to an active faith, onwards to action in pursuing him, pressing on to the goal, which is pointing the glory to God. Consider which soil you'll be when you come to youth group to Sunday morning Bible study, to church, to our time in small groups. Be ready to listen to what God has to say through all those means. I'd like to leave you with a verse out of Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 11. Come. Let's pray. Father God, I just, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here to come under your word. Lord, I pray that we will seek as Samuel did when the Lord spoke to him. Lord, that we will pursue you. Lord, that we will honor you and bring glory to you in all of our actions and deeds. Lord, I pray for small groups as we go to discuss this. And Lord, I pray that you will just allow that to be fruitful. Lord, work in our hearts how you will to your glory in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.